Take your Bible, turn to Psalm 25, verse number 6. Psalm 25, verse 6. We are doing a series of messages on walking with God. And we have been going through Psalm 25, which is a menu of different things that we can do to walk with the Lord Jesus Christ in our life. We have been focused on verse number 6, and uh, verse number 6 is a petition to the Lord to remember His tender mercies. Look at 25.6. It says this, Remember, O Lord, Thy tender mercies and Thy loving kindnesses, for they have been ever of old. So we spent in the last message talking about the tender mercies of God. And there is so much on that issue, we're going to pick up where we left off. We're going to talk again about some new things about the tender mercies of the Lord. <clears throat> so let's pray. Father, help me again tonight. Bless the message. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. We've looked at five things so far about the tender mercies of God. So now we're going to look at number six. Look at Psalm 119, verse 77. Here's what the Bible says. We are to desire the reception of His tender mercies. The reception of His tender mercies. Look at Psalm 119, the first part of verse 77. Let thy tender mercies come unto me that I may live. You know, what an example we have set for us by the life and the faith of the old Puritan saint, Thomas Hooker. As his death approached, those around Thomas's bedside, they said to him, Brother Hooker, you are going to receive your reward. And he said, no, no, I go to receive mercy. The psalmist pleaded here with God, Lord, I need your compassion. I need your compassion. I need your tender mercies. Let them come that I may live. By the way, we need all that stuff too. This was his song, and it ought to be our song, too. This man knew that he was sunk without the patience, kindness, and the compassion of God Almighty. We should all fall to pieces without God's compassion for us. Man, we'd be in bad shape -o without the compassion of the Lord. Because of his compassion, we are given strength to hold the ropes of stress and strain that pull and tug at our time and our health. Because of his compassions, we have hope when we are hurt or helpless, like a, like a sparrow with a broken wing. Because of his compassions, we have peace when others are perplexed, paranoid, or in a state of panic over their problems. God gives us peace, thank God. Sing this song to the Lord, beloved. Let thy tender mercies come unto me that I may live. It is the Lord that helps us to live. Uh, beloved, life, life is all about Him. It's all about Him. He gives us peace to live when afraid. He gives us power to live when we're anemic. He gives us the perception to live when astounded. He gives us provisions to live when we are aching and our appetite claws at our stomach. He gives, he gives, and he gives. You know, Augustus Caesar promised by proclamation a great sum of money that would uh, to anyone that would bring the head of a famous pirate to him. 
When the, the pirate heard about what Caesar had done, the pirate brought himself to Caesar. Caesar not only pardoned him for his former offenses, but rewarded him for the great confidence that he had in Caesar's mercy. <laughs> My question tonight to you is this. Do you have confidence in God's mercy towards you? Boy, I hope you do. If you don't, I, we, we need to pray for you. And not of that, you need to get your nose back in the book. You need to have confidence in his mercy. Will you trust his mercy and grace to save your soul? and help you through the trials that you will face in your life. Most of you have already done that. You've trusted him as Savior. But are you trusting him through the trials? That's the question. You know, Micah 6, 8 says this. He hath showed thee, O man, what is good. And what doth the Lord require of thee? Here it is. But to do justly, and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God. That's what we're to be doing, beloved. You know, there's something else about the tender mercies of God. It's found in Psalm 25, verse 6. Tender, uh, uh, God's tender mercies need to be remembered by the Lord. Look at verse 6. Remember, O Lord, thy tender mercies and thy loving kindness, for they have been ever of old. And we too should remember God's tender mercies toward us. And we should be grateful for His love and His patience with us. Hey, did you do anything today where the Lord says, man, I'll tell you what, tell you what, you're, you're stressing out my patience right now, huh? Are you doing anything like that? I hope not. Uh, but thank God for His patience. Counting our blessings and remembering God's mercy toward us will develop an attitude of gratitude to Him and it will also develop greater love for Him when you think about His mercy towards you. Uh, it will make you a better Christian. It will make you a better son or daughter. It will make you a better husband or wife, a better mother or father when you are grateful for the mercy of God in your life. You know, because of our weaknesses, we need to petition God's strengths and His tenderness. Well, the first area we have studied is remember your manner of your mercy. So now here's a second area that David talks about here in this section. David says to the Lord, Remember not my misconduct, misbehavior, mutinous behavior. Psalm 25, 7, verse first part says, Remember not the sins of my youth, nor my transgressions, he says. Lisa Brennan Jobes is the daughter of Apple's famed founder, the late Steve Jobes. She recently wrote about her final visit with the father from whom she was often estranged. About a month before Steve died from pancreatic cancer, at the age of 56, Lisa heard the words of regret spill from her emaciated, dying, famous father, who was known all over the world because of the company Apple that he started. He told his daughter this. He said, I didn't spend enough time with you when you were little. I wish we had more time. She told it, Dad. She said, Dad, it's fine. It's just fine. But he, he replied, he says, No! No, it's not okay. I didn't spend enough time with you. I, have sh I should have spent time with you. Now it's too late. She was grieved over the failures, or Steve was grieved over the failures of his past. 
And he looked into his daughter's eyes. He teared up and then he said, he said to her, I owe you one. And during that final weekend together, he repeated, repeated that phrase over and over. I owe you one. I owe you one. Sadly, regrets often leave us with an overwhelming sense of impossible indebtedness and failure. David felt that way too about the failures in his past. He asked the Lord to remember his mercy, but not remember the sins of his youth and transgressions. Oh my, yes. Oh, how reckless we can be in our teen and college years especially. Young people, if, if you do not guard yourself against immaturity, immorality, impetuousness, intoxication, indifference toward the Lord, and independence from God, you may end up making decisions that lead to addictions, sexually transmitted diseases, pregnancy out of marriage, careless accidents, or time in prison for criminal offenses. The sins of your youth can stay with you for a lifetime. Past mistakes can be hurtful, hateful, humiliating, harassing, horrendous, haunting, hellish, heartbreaking, heinous, harebrained, heartless, hypocritical, horrible, humbling, and half-witted, to name a few. They are actions and attitudes that we would just rather forget and would like the Lord to forget too. Why? Because our sins are abhorrent and they are divisive and are destructive. You look in the Bible and you find that there's a high price tag for, for sinful living. In fact, sin never goes on sale. It's always expensive. The Bible says that sin prevents our prayers from being heard. Psalm 66, 18. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me, the Bible says. Our sins are problematic to the Lord. They burden and weary him. Isaiah 43, 24. But thou hast made me to serve with thy sins. Thou hast wearied me with thine iniquities, the Lord said. Not only that, number three, our sins preach against us. Isaiah 59, 12. For our transgressions are multiplied before thee, and our sins testify against us, the Bible says. Number four, sin petrifies our heart. Hebrews 3.13, but exhort one another daily while it's called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Our sins also proclaim our guilt, the Bible says. Psalm 69, 5. Oh God, thou knowest my foolishness. Boy, does he ever know it. And my sins are not hid from thee. Now, the Lord knows when you do something wrong. Our sins also pull, pull us away from the Lord. Isaiah 59, 2. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. Our sins pull us away from the Lord. Our sins are also putrid and, and pathetic. Proverbs 14, 34. Righteousness exalteth a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people, the Bible says. The path of our sin leads to perishing or death. Genesis 2, 17. 
But of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in that day thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Paul said in Romans 5, 12, Wherefore as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. He said in Romans 6, 23, For the wages of sin is death. Beloved, if you're going to walk with the Lord in your life, if you're going to face distractions and difficulties, it will help immensely if you can turn your past over to the Lord. Turn your past over to Him. Paul did this in his life. And Paul became an outstanding Christian even though he killed Christians before he was saved. He did not allow the sins of his past, terrible past, to bog him down and sink his spirit into depression and ineffective for Jesus Christ. He didn't let that happen to him. He did not live his life making excuses as to why he could not serve the Lord Jesus Christ. He didn't do that. He said in Philippians 3.13, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. To achieve what God wants us to do, and let me say, He all wants us to do different things. But to achieve what He wants you to do, and what, what He wants me to do, there are some things we must forget. Paul mentions forgetting those things which are behind. Now, what, what does that mean? This phrase is in the present tense, indicating that Paul just went ahead and kept on forgetting. He just kept on forgetting. Now, that word forgetting is a very interesting word here. It does not mean obliterating the memories of the past. Does it mean that? It was this. It was a conscious refusal to let the things that happened in the past consume his attention and hinder his spiritual growth. He still remembered what he did in the past, but he didn't let those things bog him down, slow him down. He just kept going forward. Forgetting the things behind us does not mean erasing the sins of the past. It means breaking the power and influence of the past by living for the future and not letting our weights or victories, failures, slow us down. You just keep going forward for the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, for some people, uh, their past has good things. They have successes in the past. But if you let your successes in the past keep you from serving God today, you need to forget about the past successes. You need to move forward for Jesus Christ. Forget the things that, that are bad, but also you need to let the things that are good, you need to forget about those things. This is a new day. Today's a new day. This is a new day to serve God. What happened back there? Okay, fine. Today's a new day. Tomorrow's going to come, Lord willing. But you need to forget about everything and not live in the past. In a race, the runner's progress is hindered if he keeps looking back. I've seen many, many a race in my lifetime. I went, ran track in high school, in my junior high, and even in grade school, ran track meets and stuff like that. And one thing that coach drilled into us, he said, whatever you do, don't look back. Don't you look back. You keep your eyes on that goal. Well, Jesus is a pretty good coach too. And he's telling us to do the same thing. See, when you look back, your stride is broken. In fact, you can fall down like the story was told the other night. Um, the runner can trip. He can lose his balance if he looks back. Looking back gets his focus off the finish line and on his opponent. And this is what happened when we dwell on the successes and the failures that are in our past. We either rest on some accomplishment 
as though we have arrived or we live with a sagging spirit of regret over past defeats and mistakes. Don't let that happen, beloved. Never look back on your yesterdays in such a way that they slow your progress and their spiritual growth. Man, when I look back in, in my Christian life from the time I was 15 to now, there's a lot of things I praise the Lord for. There's a lot of things, but I don't dwell on them because I'm trying to live for him today and do new things for him today. You know, David petitioned, petitioned God's strength and his tenderness. And there's a third area that he petitioned the Lord to remember. It's found in verse 7 again, the latter part of verse 7. He says, remember me because of your merit. Verse 7, according to thy mercy, remember thou me for thy goodness sake, O Lord. David, he wanted the Lord to remember one more thing. He wanted God to remember him because God was merciful. He was faithful. He was good. He wanted the Lord to think about him, look upon or watch over him. Do you ask the Lord to do that in your life? Lord, watch over me. Keep your eye on me. Lord, help me. Don't take your eyes off of me. If you're not asking the Lord to do that, you need to start that tonight. Because there's a whole lot of stuff out there that can destroy your life. Lord, keep your, own, your, light, your, your eye on me. Help me, Lord. You know, we need God's care. We need his patience with us. We need his mercy and guidance. If we're going to walk with him each day and deal with the difficulties that come our way, we need to invite the Lord into our lives and not push him away. Let me ask, do you find yourself pushing the Lord away in your life? Do you find yourself saying, I just don't have time for you today, Lord? Do you, don't let that happen. Our attitude should be this. Lord, remember me. Listen, I'm going to tell you something. At Christmas time, do you want somebody to remember you when they're putting presents under this tree? Huh? When it's your birthday, or do you want people to remember you, especially when they sing happy birthday or bring presents and stuff like that? You kind of like people to remember that. Uh, you know what? We have that same attitude. We should have that same attitude of the Lord. Lord, remember me. Uh, just remember me every day. Remember me every day. Let me ask, do you have room for Jesus Christ in your life? That's the big question. Asking the Lord to forget his sins and look upon him because of God's goodness is the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. When a person trusts Jesus as his savior, the Bible says the blood of Christ atones or covers his sin. When God the Father looks at the redeemed sinner, he looks at the goodness of the savior and his atoning blood. That is why the Christian is allowed to go to heaven. It's not your works. It's not your church membership. It's none of those. It's the blood of Christ that has atoned for your sin. Uh, it is not because of anything that the sinner has done. Because, because Christ has done everything. If you put your faith in Jesus Christ for salvation, he promises to remember you. You are promised eternal life. John 3, 36. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. That sounds pretty good, doesn't it? Huh? And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life. But the wrath of of God abideth on him. Oh me, oh my. Unfortunately, there are people who think that they are smarter than God. And they do not believe in Jesus or his promise of salvation. The name Einstein is synonymous with brilliance. Yet a recently auctioned letter by the famed physicist reveals his lack of understanding 
about God. In a letter written one year before Einstein died, he shared his views about God and the Bible with philosopher Eric Gutkind. The handwritten letter in German stated this. Einstein said, The Word of God is for me nothing more than the expression and product of human weaknesses and the Bible a collection of honorable but still primitive legends which are nevertheless pretty childish. That was his attitude about God and God's Word. Einstein further wrote, For me, the Jewish religion, like all other religions, is an incarnation of the most childish superstitions. Well, the January 1954 letter, which was expected to sell, or it was expected to sell for about $15,000, when they auctioned it off, the uh, London auction got $400,000 for that letter on May 15, 2008. The manuscript holds the musing of a man who changed the face of physics, paved the way for nuclear power, and wrestled with the mysteries of our universe. But this so-called genius could not believe the eternal words of Jesus Christ. Except you be converted and become as a little children, you shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. If Einstein died without the Lord Jesus Christ, based on the letter, if he died without the Lord, he's in hell right now. And what he believed about the Lord, if he rejected the Lord, is going to doom him for eternity. If he's in hell right now, do you think he wish he had another chance? You think he might be thinking, why did I reject Jesus Christ? It's all true. It's all true. But now it's too late. Beloved, right standing with God comes through childlike faith in Christ. Not a superior IQ. If you trust in Christ, he will remember you because of his goodness and mercy. And we can all thank God for that. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Let's pray.